The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Hi guys, my name is Jeff Probst. Today we'll be talking at length about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, OpenSSL. Uh, yesterday we went over uh, a particularly nasty bug that came out in April, if you guys recall the Heartbleed bug. We had covered that in depth and we left some things unanswered because we just didn't have enough time. A lot of those are, you know, some of the mechanisms behind SSL and HTTPS and all of those things. Today we're going to go through those. We have uh, two sessions lined up. The first is going to be mostly exploring the beginning parts of HTTPS, what all is involved, the theory behind it, how you might secure a website, kind of a more base level, intermediate level stuff. The second session we're going to kick it up into the highest gear we can and we're going to start building certificate authorities. Um, and yes, you can build your own certificate authority. You can do anything you like with this software. This is the very same software that very large companies like uh, GoDaddy or GlobalSign or VeriSign, anything like that, they're all using this same software. So, without further ado, let us dive in. Here's what we're going to cover today. What is SSL really? And it's probably not what you think it is. You may have some clue of some parts of it. We're going, we're going to clear that up. Uh, we're going to walk through a sample SSL transaction, and then we're going to dive into certificates and how to operate and create them. So first, we have to have a working uh, vocabulary. There, there's some seats down here in the front if you guys want to come down. We have to have a working vocabulary before we can have a discussion about this. So just a couple items. Uh, SSL is the protocol we'll be discussing today also known in a sister protocol as TLS. For the purposes of these two presentations, we will treat them as one product because they practically are. Uh, TLS does away with some of the unhealthy patterns that SSL assumed. Oh, there we go. Um, we are talking most specifically about how to use SSL with web traffic, which is used, uh, done using this HTTP protocol. We're going to wrap SSL around HTTP to form HTTPS. That's what you see at the beginning of your URLs when you go to a secured website. And here at the bottom we have the tool we're going to be using to implement all of these things. This is directly from the RFC, the most recent RFC defining what the goal of this software is. The primary goal of the SSL protocol is to provide privacy and reliability between two communicating applications. It's going to give us four very important things, the first of which is authenticity. The sender of a message, a secured message, is who he says he is. That the message cannot be read by outside parties in transit. That the messages were not altered or corrupted in transit. And if they were corrupted or tampered with, resend the message. The SSL protocol gives us the ability to do all four of these things. Now, most of the time when you read up about SSL, your focus is upon the very beginning stages, the SSL certificates, the public key cryptography, managing those stupid little private keys that I can never seem to keep track of. But seriously, I have a bad habit of creating a private key and then losing it, and then later on when I need to go create another SSL certificate, I don't know where the key is. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, a lot of the focus is on the domain names that are behind it. Again, this is just one small part of what SSL can do but it's also going to dominate our focus because it's the most important part. And when you have a secured site, you often have seen this, the address bar can turn green or you can see the little green lock symbol. When people think of SSL, that's normally what they think of, the green lock. Which is important, but again, it's only one part of what SSL does. So the certificate and key pair parts that we focus on are at the beginning, and they're really only for two things. Again, the authenticity of the message. Is this server who it says it is? 
and can the server and client exchange information confidentially at the very beginning of the transaction? Uh, the very beginning, the public key cryptography uses asymmetric encryption, which is hideously expensive. Um, using very large three or four hundred digit primes that take a long time to compute and even longer time to work on. It's not practical to use asymmetric cryptography for the entire communication channel. So we use it at the very beginning to establish a shared key and then we switch down into using a much more efficient symmetric encryption. This is an example of public key cryptography. We're just going to go over it briefly. Uh, if you've never experienced it, public key cryptography means that you have a key pair, a private and a public uh, set of numbers. They work together mathematically, and you can, using, using either of those keys, you can encrypt a message and decrypt it with the other key. Now, it doesn't matter which side of the key pair you designate as private or public. It's two-way. It's just important that you keep one half of it as private. So you can send a message out to everybody else. You can encrypt it with your private key. And you have published your public key. So then everybody can decrypt the message and know that that message came from you. It's authentic from you because you're the only one in, that holds that private key. Likewise, if someone needs to send a message that can only be read by you, they can use your public key to encrypt the message. And then you can use your private key to decrypt it. We use this feature to begin the SSL transaction right at the beginning. So an SSL transaction starts with the authenticity step. The client contacts the server and gives it a random number. We're going to use this random number later. The server says, oh, hi, and responds with its own random number. Then the server says, here's who I am, and gives the client an SSL certificate for it to chew on. Now the client has to decide at this point if it actually trusts the certificate that's been given to it before it goes any farther. Why would you trust or not trust a certificate? Well, we're going to talk about that later and at length in the second part, in the second presentation. Uh, you may decide to trust it because it's from a company you know, like VeriSign. Or it's been signed by a company you know, like you're the one you work for perhaps. You have a certificate authority in your uh, place of employment. Sometimes you may choose not to trust it because it looks funny. Perhaps they used MD5 for the hashing and you just don't trust MD5. And if, if you are still trusting MD5 as a hashing algorithm, let's talk afterwards, please. Um, maybe you don't trust the hashing algorithm. Maybe something doesn't look quite right. Maybe you don't know who issued the certificate and you don't trust it. And you make that choice right up front. So let's say you do accept it. The next part is you exchange keys. So the client now is responsible for getting a very, very large number called the premaster key, and premaster secret, excuse me. It encrypts this secret with the server's public key and sends it over. Since the server has the private side of that key pair, it can decrypt it. So now the only two people in the world that know what this premaster secret number is the client and the server. They then can use those two numbers that they shared earlier. Keep in mind that X and Y were sent in the clear. Anybody knows what X and Y is. But only these two know what the premaster secret is. Using a well-defined algorithm, both of them use these three numbers to calculate a master secret key, which is used for the rest of the SSL transaction. At this point, we are done with the asymmetric cryptography phase of the SSL con connection. And we're going to drop down to using the far more efficient uh, stream ciphers. Uh, we'll use the master secret key to generate other numbers. And again, they are well-defined algorithms, and they're a little bit dry and long, and so we're not going to go into those here. The important thing to note is because only these two individuals have all of the information required, only these two inv individuals can be privy to the conversation that is going on. This provides our confidentiality. We have the authenticity in the first step, confidentiality in the second step. What about the other two? Well, when you send a message across SSL, you're breaking it up into very small packets, 16 KB or less. The packet is encrypted using the master shared key, and a message authentication code is calculated that goes on the end. The format and the algorithm used for the MAC is agreed upon 
in early on in the SSL transaction. Both parties know what's going to be coming. And so both parties can calculate the MAC and know did the packet make it across as it was expected. And if it detects, say a client sends a packet to a server and it was uh, tampered with or some of the bits got dropped in, in transit, then the server calculates the MAC and says, this is different than what you said it was. I don't trust that this message was, I was received properly. And then it can send a message back to the client saying, I need you to resend this packet because it wasn't right. So this provides us the integrity, the integrity and whatever the fourth one is that I've already forgotten. <laughs> Sorry. So now that we understand how the SSL transaction is proceeding, how it operates and how it starts, we have to talk about certificates. In fact, we're going to be talking about certificates for the next hour and a half. A certificate has several important pieces of information in it, namely a subject and issuer, validity start and end date, the public key, and any, in any extensions. Let's drop down to the command line here and check one out. Let's see. Here we go. I have posted online, I have some resources. Can you guys read that or do I need to make this text bigger? Okay, hang on. I'm really good at that, don't worry. Let's see, is that big enough? Do we need to go 24? Let's try 20. That's what I've been told. No. Okay, so I have in here some sample certificates, a sample certificate signing request, we'll talk about it later, a sample key. I generated all these last night. So we're going to look at what this uh, certificate has in it. And again, we will go over this command that I'm typing out later. I just want to show you what a certificate looks like. Thank you. Okay, so this is the contents of an X509 certificate. Some of this is really important, some of this we don't actually care about. So version number is really important to SSL, but we don't care. Serial number, same thing. Signature algorithm, again, important to SSL, but it's, it tells us something about the certificate. The, the stronger that this, can you guys see that highlight? Yep. Okay. The stronger that this is, the more trust you can have that the certificate is, uh, is a good strong certificate. Now, if they're using MD5 here, you just take it and run away. Just throw that certificate away, you ain't touching it. They're using SHA-1, that's pretty common these days. I've started moving up to SHA-128 for a lot of mine. And that maybe is a bit aggressive, but I got scared because the NSA is listening. Okay. So here we have the issuer and the subject line. These are probably the two most important lines in the SSL certificate. We'll look at the subject first. This is the information that I gave to create this certificate. Uh, I told it that I lived in U.S. in Dallas, that I was belonging to a company called Internet Widgets, PTY, I don't know what that stands for. Uh, this is the, probably the most important line right here. CN stands for common name. This is what the domain name is that relates, that you'll be getting this SSL certificate for. This certificate was issued by a certificate authority that I created a couple months ago for my work. I work for a company called ModX. We do hosting and other things. And we wanted to be able to give our clients development SSL certificates so they could test out functionality. So I created a certificate authority that allowed me to generate development certificates with some modicum of security and reliability. And they wouldn't have to rely upon generating them themselves or anything like that. So I signed this uh, sample certificate with the certificate authority that I created a couple months ago. We see here, uh, right at the top, again, I know you can't see the highlight, but the validity states not before, not after. This is the length of time in which the certificate will be active. After this length of time, doesn't count. 
and it does go down to the second. I have actually missed the window for using your certificate by about five seconds before. It's really irritating. Another very important part of the certificate that doesn't mean much to us is the RSA public key. We can see at the top that this particular key was 2048 bits, which is a pretty common size. I wouldn't go less than that when you're creating your key. You can go more, but now you're costing more computation time. It depends on your level of risk, what you're you know, willing to tolerate. The higher or the larger your bit size is, the longer it will take to crack using normal means, but the longer it will take to compute every single time you use it. And down here at the very bottom, we have some important extensions. This one right here in particular, CA equals false, means I cannot use this SSL certificate to sign other SSL certificates. If this were a certificate authority, sir, this would be CA true. Some of this information here is vestigial, like this uh, Netscape cert type and Netscape comment is just left over in the configuration files from back a long time ago. This is important here, the authority key identifier and the subject key identifier. Uh, we can pull, actually you can see this at the top. Where is it? No, oh, that's the signature number. There's basically, ah, here it is. We take this signature algorithm, we produce a thumbprint from it, and we put it in here, in the subject key identifier field. Likewise, whoever signed this certificate did the same when they did the authority key identifier. This is how we can trace the progeny of an SSL certificate, because they come in trees. Okay. Do we have any questions, or anybody want to look at some more stuff on this certificate before we move on? Sir? Exactly. That's exactly what this part is down here. Signature algorithm. I'm sorry? Oh, the question was, what's to stop us from changing the certificate authority flag to true and just signing away? Well, the entirety of this certificate has a MAC on it, and it's been signed by the issuer. If we make a change to even one bit in this entire file, the MAC will no longer match what the file says, and no one will treat the certificate as valid. Sir. How does this certificate, which has been signed by a certificate authority in this configuration, or this what we're looking at, the certificate information, how does that vary from a self-signed certificate? How can these look at the difference from what we're looking at right now? The question was, what is the difference, uh, how does it look, a self-signed certificate versus what we're looking at now? Um, I don't think I have an example handy, but a self-signed certificate, the subject and issuer fields will be identical because you do not have a parent certificate signing, your issuer is yourself. And usually, uh, if you use a self-signed certificate, your browser will complain, but say, it's okay, everything else looks fine. We just don't trust this issuer. If the issuer is yourself, that's kind of funny. We have any other questions before I move on? Sir? So as far as the validity fields for the, for the time, mm -hmm. if a key is expired, is, is, it, is it possible to maybe subvert that through changing the time on the client or something like that? Um, some clarification. So the question was, if the, if the key expires, then can we change the time, roll back the clock, and make it still valid? Uh, the key actually, the, the key and the certificate are separate components. The key remains. The certificate is the part that expires. That being said, uh, no, if you were to try and change, again, if you were to alter the bits in the file to try and say that the valid after is actually in 2016, then the signature hash would no longer match. Oh. Top and put your clock back into the valid time, which does work. I suppose yes, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. Except when you send your emails out, people are like, what are you doing in December? <laughs> and you're the one that gets to answer that question. So, well, I have a certificate and I'm just too lazy to regenerate it. So I keep sending my clock back to December and it makes me feel like Christmas. Okay. Any other questions, sir? Mm -hmm. if, if the server certificate has expired, that, I mean, you still have the ability to use that certificate. Mm -hmm. At any point, you can decide, I don't care what the certificate says, I will still trust it. I don't care that the signature hash doesn't match. 
I don't care that I don't know the issuer. I need a secure connection and I'm going to trust this anyway. The green lock comes about because it has been independently verified through a large community web of trust means that this is a trustworthy certificate. Sir. That's correct. How does it differ from what changes when you go to a wildcard? The only thing that changes, and you guys are actually jumping ahead. This is great though. Uh, the only thing that changes, uh, I'm sorry, it line wraps here. It's got a C on one side and N on the other, common name. That will change. So where it says self 2014, that'd be just an asterisk. So asterisk. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we have any other questions? VeriSign. The question was, what is the uh, you know, quality of SSL vendors, comparison of them? It's, about, it's, it's a matter of how much risk you're willing to take on. How much do you trust GoDaddy will be a going concern in two years? How much do you trust that the other guy? VeriSign, I'm pretty sure, will be around in two years. They've been around for 15 or 20 years already in this very business. Um, Let's say I'm not worried about GoDaddy going away in two years. Okay. That is a very long and involved question, and I would love to speak with you more about it later. He asked about um, uh, if a client computer had a specific problem with an SSL certificate. That's starting to trail into what if land. And I love the what if game. We're just going to do it off camera, unfortunately. So do we have any other questions before we move on? Sir. Is the certificate any less secure effectively connection? No, sir. The question was, uh, is a self-signed certificate any better or worse security-wise than a typical certificate with just a single domain name? Not at all. So in fact, it may make more sense for you to get a wildcard if you have two or three subdomains and you don't want to manage three certificates. You don't want to pay a vendor for three certificates. Get one wildcard. Then it's only one thing you have to maintain. But the flip side of that means you now are exposing yourself to a little bit more risk because you're using the same certificate in multiple places. And so it's about deciding what your level of risk is, what you're tolerable to. Any other questions? I'm sorry, how would that be more risk? So you have, uh, the more places that a certificate is used, the more servers, what happens if someone is able to break into a server? They can get access to the private key, they can get access to the certificate, then they can masquerade as you. So, sir. I'd just like to point out that um, as far as cell sign certificates go, the reason that I stopped using them is because you end up training your users to ignore browser warnings. That's a very good point. The comment was he uh, no longer uses self signed certificates because uh, in order to use them, you have to click through. You have to say, okay, I don't mind that this certificate isn't valid. And it trains your users to do that in cases when I actually need to stop and say, wow, this isn't valid. Sir? And so kind of for both, uh, a, a, you generating your own CA kind of takes care of both because you can generate individual certificates per server mm -hmm. and you can create one simple, easy way, a verifiable way for a user to import your CA so you can trust your CA, um, you know, note, note your hash of it mm -hmm. when they're importing it, which they'll, they'll then be prompted and say, hey, does this match? Mm -hmm. uh, when, you're, when you're trusting your root certificate in Windows, for example, uh, you are prompt. Yeah. So uh, the gentleman here commented that uh, if you are wanting to use your own SSL certificate, it's far better to create your own certificate authority. Then you do one importation of the root certificate, and that builds an entire tree of trust down from that. And in fact, we're going to talk about that very thing in a second presentation. Um, the, the comment was that there's a danger of man-in-the-middle attacks at the point of accepting that certificate. Um, that's why we have the uh, hash verifications. Uh, someone can masquerade. You're saying at the beginning of an SSL transaction, um, someone can masquerade as another server, but they won't be able to prove the validity of it because they, they won't have an SSL certificate that's signed by uh, the valid party and won't have all the matching information. But if you're at a point where you're accepting permanently that CA, that initial, initial 
Mm. So the, when accepting like a, a self-created CA, uh, I would go to the computer and do it myself. I would not trust a user to go and do it. That way I know, and I got to realize that if you've got 10,000 computers you're maintaining, you probably can't do that. But I can do a push, you know, if I'm on Windows doing some kind of exchange or a boot up login, something if that pushes the certificate out. If they're in the Windows world, you just push it out via yeah. GPO. There we go. So in the next world, I can tell people, here's what I need you to run. And I need you to check in and do this. I need you to stand up, raise your right arm, and swing around three times, and then shout Eureka. And that way I know you've installed the certificate and you've read all of my instructions. Just as an example. You guys, we're going to hop back into the presentation here. These are all great questions, by the way. Where is my presentation? That's not it. I've lost my presentation. There it is. Found it. OK, so we covered all the parts of the certificate format. Oh. The actual format of the file itself on the hard drive can come in many different forms. Um, we're just going to breeze through this because we're going to be running low on time soon. Um, the most common that I see is called PIM format, P-E-M. It's just a plain text ASCII rendering of the binary data in an SSL, SSL certificate. Uh, used by a lot of the open source browsers because it's simple, straightforward, easy to understand. You can manipulate these because they're just ASCII text, but in doing so, if you miscopy it, you're going to get your certificate uh, invalid errors. Another format, which is pretty similar, is a, a raw binary format of the same information that PIM has. It's called DER, and it's used mostly by Java. I have practically no experience with DER. It's because I have very little work with SSL in Java, and I'm very thankful for that fact, because I hear it's terrible. I, my apologies to anyone who does do that. Uh, also, another common format, PKCS12, is used by Windows and IIS. It is a different style of file. It's actually a container format and allows you to contain multiple certificates and keys in one file. So this is the format used by IIS. They are annoying in the fact that they don't allow you to import and export PIM or DER certificates. I think it's a Windows thing, but I could speculate all day on that. We don't, I don't really deal with PKCS12 format very much except when a client sends me a certificate and says, here we go, I got this from GoDaddy, and I'm like, that's not going to work for us. Thankfully, you can convert from one format to another relatively easily. In general, let's stick with PIM because it's easiest to work with, and that's the one we're going to be using here today. Let's talk about the different types of certificates. We've already covered a lot of this. We have the standard certificate, which you saw up here. Um, it's just got a single domain name, uh, a single issuer, not self-signed, nothing special. Uh, a wildcard certificate was mentioned by a gentleman over here. The first part of the domain is replaced with an asterisk, which means you can use any subdomain you wish. So I used throughout this uh, presentation an example domain of grimoire.re. If I wanted to create a wildcard for that, it would just be asterisk.grimoire.re. I could use that for www, I could use that for self 2014, 2013, whatever I wanted. Subject alternate name, what happens if you have more than one domain name and you have an entity that's responding from several domain names? Well, there is an extension to the X509 format that lets you put more than one domain name on a certificate. It's called subject alternate name. We're gonna look at a little bit of that configuration later. It's terribly useful. It's also a little more irritating to set up than normal. Sir? With the subject alternate names, I noticed that, if I understand correctly, it seems like that's good for wildcards where you want to identify, let's say, five domains that you've got on your server. Mm -hmm. Do you have to provide those at the time the search is generated? Yes. The, the, whoever is signing your certificate has to know what all of, this, all of the domains are. Now, if you're using a wildcard, that covers everything. But let's, this, you would use a subject alternate name. Let's say you have, you're selling widgets, and you've got widgeteuphoria.com and widgetsrus.com. And you don't want to have to maintain two certificates. You get a single certificate with two subject alternate names for both of those domains on there. And if you've got a really nice uh, certificate authority, you can do wildcards on those. Although I don't often see a wildcard subject alternate name certificate. That's pretty rare. Sir? Or just 
Yes. You can choose to do that. Uh, the, the response was that you can choose to use subject alternate names to do a couple uh, specifically enumerated subdomains, mail dot, www dot, FTP dot. If you're using FTP, let's talk afterwards. <laughs> Sir. Yeah, uh, with subject alternate name, let's say we have uh, just the root domain, say foo.com, and we have a www.foo.com. Do we need to use a subject alternate name in that for something like HTTPS? Or to okay, so the question was if we have just a standard domain, foo.com, and we have one subdomain, www, and we are directing traffic on both of those to the website. Unfortunately, because remember at the beginning we said that SSL wraps around HTTPS. Therefore, the SSL layer happens before HTTPS gets going. As a result of this, if you don't have all of the names that you're going to use potentially for the site on your certificate, then you may get a certificate validity error. Even if you're redirecting foo.com to www.foo.com. If you go to foo.com and your certificate says it should be www.foo.com, your browser will throw an error. Sir. Yeah, it has to, the question was, can you use a Apache re redirect or Nginx redirect to do it? Uh, you have to use a DNS of some kind, um, or you have to get it in the certificate, because the redirect happens after the SSL connection is completed. So it doesn't know, at the, at the time the SSL is happening, it doesn't know that the domains will match up eventually. Sir. To clarify that, if, if a user goes to HTTP foo.com, That's correct. He was stating, uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear on that. If you're staying in the HTTP world, you can redirect using Apache or Nginx all you like. You can even redirect from non-HTTPS non over to secured HTTPS. It's only if you're starting in the secured HTTPS that you cannot use a web server redirect to take care of that. Do we have any other questions? Sir. Uh, I'm going to disagree with you here, not because I'm being mean, even though I am mean sometimes. Uh, in the last five years, uh, a new technology called subject name interface, subject SNI. name, SNI, that's what I know it as. SNI means that we are now supplying a domain field at the time of our beginning our SSL transaction. And so we can actually use now uh, the same IP for many different SSL encrypted domains. Yeah, all, all of XP, the uh, browsers, uh, the actual SSL security stack doesn't support SNI. So if you have XP users, I'm sorry. Uh, about a year and a half, I, I decided it was time to cut those guys loose. Sorry, XP users. I think there's a couple old embedded devices and a couple older cell phones that also don't do SNI. But I would say everything that's been produced in the last six years does support it. And it's the solution for us going forward. It was introduced because a lot of extra IPs were being used and wasted because you had three sites on a server. And they were all very low load. But because they all had SSL, each of them had to have their own IP. And this contributed to our current IPv4 address ex exhaustion. So they introduced SNI to help fix that. Any other questions? OK. Extended validation, we're not going to touch on this very much. Uh, in the process of getting your certificate signed by uh, a certificate authority, they will do some fact checking in to make sure that who you say you are is who you actually are. In an, in an extended validation certificate, they do far more fact checking than normal. They will actually go and look up, is this a business? Where is this business registered? Are they visible according to the local chamber of commerce? 
Do they have a business card? Do they have contacts? They do a very exhaustive search. Technically, you're not offering anything extra other than more validity. That's why it's called extended validation. It's the same exact certificate with an extra flag set that says, man, we spent a lot of money and time investigating this guy, and we know he's bulletproof. Some companies like that. They consider it an advantage over other companies that don't have them. They're willing to spend the extra money to say, man, we are bulletproof. Look at this. VeriSign says that we have extended validation, and that's worth it to them. The SSL certificate model is built upon trust. You're peddling trust from the top to the bottom. Uh, each certificate is issued by a parent. We've been calling it a certificate authority or an intermediate or a root, any number of words that we could use there. We'll discuss that at more length in the second presentation. Uh, and again, if you trust the judgment of the parent certificate's owner, so if you come to me and say, Can I, will you please sign my certificate and you trust me, then you will likely have allowed my certificate authority that you saw earlier, that ModX root certificate authority. You will have added that to your accepted certificates. And any cer certificate that I sign, you will trust. So if he has also accepted me as a valid and quality certificate authority, then your certificate signed by me will be valid for him. It's a whole trust model, and it's based upon parentage in a tree. This breaks down when we're talking about self-signed certificates, we've mentioned it a couple times, where the subject and issuer are the same person. There the trust is, do you just trust that individual? You don't have a tree, you don't have any other information, you just have, is that individual trustworthy? Well, we've already talked about a lot of this stuff. So you guys have been asking some great questions, but you've been tearing chunks out of my presentation. So we're gonna zip through the next couple slides here. Oh, here's a good one. Chains of certificates are usually assembled in three parts. You have a root certificate. Oh, we're going backwards here. A root certificate, which is protected like Fort Knox. It is as good as gold. It's the one that you use to sign intermediate certificates, which do all the real work. So you want to keep this thing protected. If anyone gets access to your root certificate, your public key, you're sunk. That means they can sign anything. And because you're a trusted individual, you're a trusted vendor of uh, certificates. If your root certificate gets out, you're sunk. Your entire business is gone. The code page is last week. It just up and disappeared. That's what will happen to you. I'm sorry? Mm, that just happened? Okay. A uh, gentleman over here said that this actually happened to a Belgian certificate authority that some hacker got in and got a hold of their root certificate and key and no one trusted them anymore. You're selling trust. Sir? Would it have to be a hacker? Uh, basically what I'm picking up is that this root certificate is really important. So if I just had physical access to the server, couldn't I just copy the root certificate, take it home, sign my certificate, make me awesome? You could. Um, the, 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 the statement was, uh, what's to stop a person from being on the physical premises of wherever the certificate is signed and just sign another one right there? Uh, there's many different checks built in. Uh, if you are an actual certificate authority and you're selling trust, then you will use what's called a hardware security mechanism. And you won't be storing your SSL certificate just kind of randomly on a hard drive. You'll be storing in the HSM. You'll probably have that locked inside a vault with an air gap and a couple other things. It's that important. I mean, you spend millions of dollars to secure your root certificate because the whole thing folds if you don't have it. If I wanted to host that email, say I hosted it on Linux, mm -hmm. maybe a three-letter organization could get a copy of my certificate and read all my email anyway. Probably. Okay. But you're the end user at that point. Your certificate has been signed by somebody else. That is a good point, though. If you're generating root certificate or certificate authorities or doing anything fun like that, it's not a good idea to leave it out on a server that's accessible by the internet. For the purposes of this demonstration, I have created a, a certificate authority here and it's on this laptop. After it's done, I will revoke all the certificates. So don't even think about trying to knock it down. But you want to keep, keep in mind that anything can be gotten anywhere. I know it sounds paranoid, but just if you keep that mindset, then you'll have enough paranoia to keep your certificate authority uh, safe. Sir. Probably air in a vault 
That's correct. The root would be your gap to the vault. So if you're a vendor, like, say, Verisign, mm -hmm. That is a perfect leading question. He was asking, if you have your root certificate air-gapped and locked away where no one can ever get to it, how do you use it? Well, what you do is you sign an intermediate certificate in which you're assuming some risk by keeping that intermediate certificate in a place where you can get to it. Every so often when you need a new intermediate certificate, you go trot into the, the vault 40 feet underground pass the air gap and you on that system that it's on create a new intermediate certificate. You then bring that intermediate certificate back out into the light of day and you use that certificate for your business. Did that answer your question? Uh, the comment was, at, in doing so, you would have to, you would invalidate the other certificates that you may have. That's actually uh, not correct. You can have many different certificates signed by one root. Well, no, I'm sorry. They're still valid. Mm -hmm. I'm saying if you're trying to cycle through to keep your security fresh, let's say, mm -hmm. you would effectively be suggesting that those other ones should go away. No. Like if you've got a business and you're trying what, to... When you revoke the intermediate, sir, for the Rotation, then anything signed by that intermediate is now untrusted because That's it's intermediate. That, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, right. So the, the statement is we, we've come to a consensus that when you revoke an intermediate certificate, all the certificates that it signed underneath it become revoked as well. It has to be that way because it's a tree of trust. Yes, sir. Um, so when you say intermediate certificate, is that like an intermediate CA? That's correct. An intermediate certificate is an intermediate certificate authority. Any of these certificates could be certificate authorities if their right flag is set, like we saw earlier. So we have created lower security, higher risk intermediate certificates that we are more willing to yank if need be. Now we still want to protect them as much as possible. They will still be in a hardware security mechanism. They will still be in a secure place, probably armed guards, lasers, poison gas, the whole nine yards. Because you're signing a bunch of SSL certificates with this one, and you want to make sure that you don't have to revoke every single one of those and reissue them. That's really expensive, and you don't want to have to do that. I think a zone, when you noted those flags, was that back in when you, you dumped out the X509 certificate and said, you know, hey, here's the different attributes of it? That's correct. The flag, if you want to go back, we can go look at that again real quick. Um, it's up to you. Uh, I think it'd be helpful. Let's go look at that again. Oh, look, it's still up. I pointed out a flag right here. This is the top line. In this particular certificate, it says CA is false. If this flag is instead set to true, then I can use this certificate to sign um, child certificates. Uh, and yes, if you're thinking, maybe I can craft a certificate and send it to a vendor with that flag enabled, they look for that. In fact, they probably may choose to never do business with you again, or at least they'll give you a slap on the wrist and say, that was silly. We're not going to sign that. And in fact, built into OpenSSL are some mechanisms to prevent the copying of those kinds of extensions across. Okay. Okay, so we discussed root and intermediate. We know an end user certificate, that's the ones that we typically handle every single day. Right, and this, this point here is what we discussed just a little bit ago. How are we doing on time? 18 minutes. 18 minutes, great, thank you. Let's get into how to actually do this thing. We're going to operate the OpenSSL binary and do a whole bunch of useful stuff with it. Um, it's not just a library, it's a binary executable that we can use to create keys, we can create certificates, we can sign certificates, we can revoke them, we can manage them, we can do anything we want. And it's really simple, it's just OpenSSL and then a command that OpenSSL understands and then some options that go along with it. Like an example, this is what we ran to look at the contents of that certificate just now. Uh, we are running the OpenSSL command. The X509 command within, op sorry, that wasn't supposed to happen. The X509 command says to OpenSSL, I want to read the contents of this file as if it were an X509 certificate. Show me what's in there. In this case, the default is for it to always print out a binary copy of the certificate, 
We don't care about that. We already have that. So I've specified an option of no out. Dang it. Sorry. And then I've also specified the option of text, which says convert this digital format into something we can read. If we didn't specify text, we would get a bunch of gobbledygook that doesn't mean anything to us. So we can do some other things, such as, I just want to look at the subject and issuer of this certificate. Okay, so here, instead of printing the entirety, well, that's really ugly, I apologize, let's do that again. There we go. Instead of printing the entirety of everything in the certificate, I've printed just the subject and the issuer. I can print just the validity. I can print just the hash. I can print just the public key modulus. And you can use this if you're trying to do some scriptability or something like that. So here's a couple of our base commands that we'll be using. REC stands for request, new request. Uh, when you go to create a SSL certificate, you have to first create a certificate signing request. It's basically an empty data structure with the information that you filled in and is ready and waiting to receive the authority of the signing certificate authority that you're going to. If we want to create a new public key or a new key pair, we can use the gen RSA command. X509 we've already used a couple times. It shows information about an existing certificate. And CA, we we'll use that extensively in the second presentation. If you want to sign somebody else's certificate, we use this command here. So there's some common options you may see used almost all the time. Uh, OpenSSL is acting as a, as a filter. You're giving it some input and it's giving you some output. You can specify using uh, file redirectors through standard in and standard out if you wish. I generally prefer to use dash in or dash out. It's a little bit cleaner and you, end up, uh, you may end up with some data you don't expect if you're using redirection. So you'll see this dash in or dash out commonly. You may see dash new quite frequently if you're creating a new key, if you're creating a new certificate signing request, if you're creating a new self-signed certificate, the new option is used to designate, hey, we're gonna be doing something different than normal. And almost every single operation you might use OpenSSL for in this situation requires a key. So you give it the key file with this option here. A lot of these have a lot of very strange options. Some of them not so strange. Some of them are like, what in the heck is that? So you can use dash dash help to get a full listing of everything you can do. Let's go check that one out. That's marvelous. I don't know why it's doing that. I think my screen is too big for this to work well. So let's just do this. Oh, I know why. Uh, yes. Let's bring it to standard error. There we go. Oh, it doesn't know that option help. So we have a whole bunch of potential options here that may or may not be useful to you at the time you're invoking this command. Um, this is an invaluable thing when you just can't remember the specific invocation of a thing. Use this first and refresh your memory. So here I can print the serial number, the subject hash, issuer hash, all of the hashes, subject, issuer, email, start date, end date, purpose. I can put all these individual information using this command. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here that we just don't care about. Later on, we may care about it when we start getting into the deeper parts of how certificate authorities work. So now let's get into how we're actually going to do this. We're going to use all the knowledge that we've just discussed, and we're going to create a new certificate. We have to create a key file first, then we use that to create a certificate signing request. And then we submit that certificate signing request to our vendor, which in this case I will be acting as both the client and the vendor. The vendor looks over the certificate signing request and says, hmm, okay, I agree with that. I, I, you're a trustworthy fellow, I'll sign your key. I'll sign your certificate and returns it back to you. You get back an SSL certificate signed by the issuer. You have hung on to your private key and you'll need both of those for later installation into your web server. Now one of the things I like to do, this is, you don't have to do this, but it makes things a lot easier, especially when you're juggling lots of keys. Name them all something similar. So 
when I was testing making a key for the website that this presentation is hosted on, I named all of my files with domain name dot whatever they are. So self.grandma.re.key dot CSR dot CRT. And it doesn't seem like much, but when you've got four certificates and five keys and you don't know which goes to which, that gets really irritating to try and figure it out. So save yourself some time and use a naming scheme like this. So we're going to go and generate a new private key. Ah, we need to discuss this before we do. When you generate a private key, sir. That would be wise. Uh, I generally, uh, as long as I have a domain separated out by domain, I'll just look at the certificate and see when the validity ends, and that informs me what I need. I have had some uh, revocations and other things I needed to track, where it would have been useful to have the date, because then the dates don't match anymore. If you, when you go to renew a key, or you do, or I'm sorry, renew a certificate, you can use your existing key, yeah? The question was, when you go to renew an SSL certificate after it's expired, you can reuse the same key. Yes, that's correct. The key never expires. As long as the key is still confidential, it's valid to be used. And even if it's not confidential, you can still use that key. No one will tell you not to. It's just not a wise idea. <laughs> so when you create a key, oh, sir. That's a good question. He stated, is there, it, a better question would be, is there a reason to not generate a new key when you're generating a new CSR? Honestly, I always do them at the same time. Uh, if someone has compromised your, public, or your private key somehow and you don't know about it, reusing that same key on a new certificate would be problematic. You're already having to create a CSR. You might as well create a new key file as well. That's a very good point. When you create a key file, you have an option to encrypt that key file. And in normal operation, like for the certificate authority I have here, I keep my keys encrypted. Who knows if someone else gets their hands on it. But if you're using this SSL certificate with a web browser, no one's going to be sitting there at the console when someone restarts Apache to be able to type in the password for your key. Therefore, if you're using the SSL certificate, and an automated operation like a web server, you need to use an unencrypted form. Let's go do that real quick. Also worth pointing out that if you're on System D, you don't get console access. So with Apache, you have to use the System D as a password thing. And with Nginx, you're screwed. Because there's an, an Nginx has no way of taking a command to grab the password. And you don't get console access from the starting daemon. And so the Nginx fails to start if the key is encrypted. So Doug has pointed out that if you're using LaunchD or Nginx, you're screwed. Sorry, that, that's, my, that's my summary. Sorry. Uh, in general, if you're, if you're deploying your cert into a web server environment, don't encrypt your key. It will be pain and peril, and you'll be upset. And then you'll call me, and I'll be upset, because I'll be busy drinking when you call me, and I won't want to be interrupted. <laughs> so let's generate a new key. We're going to generate a non-encrypted key. Actually, no, I think to generate non-encrypted, I don't have to specify anything. That's right. Um, what domain are we going to do this for? Someone call out a domain. What was that? Happy puppies. OK. We now have a very short key. It's only 512 bits long because I didn't tell it what size. The default key size, if you don't tell OpenSSL, is only 512 bits long. Do you see that at the bottom there? That's not long enough. So when you do your key, don't do like I did and forget an option. We're going to delete that key. We're going to do it again. And every time I create a key, I'm spending entropy and randomness on my system, which is costly. We'll talk about that next, next presentation. Sir. Yes, until that gets tapped. And then depending on how you have your system settings, it may block until it untaps, or it'll move to you random. Is there a, a command line argument to use a hardware random number generator? Yes, in fact, let's go look at that. That's a very good question. The question was, is there a way to use a hardware generator instead? And we can see here, oops. Kind of like this? That's a good idea. I'll do that when, I, when I'm finished. Um, let's see here. 
Here we go. Uh, towards the bottom we see an option here, dash engine, if we wish to use an external hardware mechanism. Sorry, let's see if I can boost that. Um, there, engine's near the top now so you can see it better. Um, if I have an external hardware engine, now I've actually never used one of these, I've long wanted to, but they're a little bit more expensive than I'm willing to do for a hobby. Um, you only buy one of these if you're serious about things. Um, or if you just have way too much money and like playing around with it. If you do, then let's talk after the presentation, please. Because I got a lot of projects we could discuss. Um, but here we see an option for specifying a, in a different engine to do the randomness. Possibly a hardware device, hardly, possibly a different software device, whatever you like. So let's see, did we create our key? What was it, happy puppies? Where did you come up with that? No, that's not right. Text. Whoops, I'm using the wrong command. There we go, here we go. Now we get to look at the contents of the private key. We see, or the key pair, excuse me. We see a private key here. And we see a public part of it. And here it's uh, two of the prime numbers that were used to create the key. A whole lot of stuff in here. There's a whole lot of math involved. There's a very fantastic reading to be had. It's a joy to learn how RSA works, and it's really amazing to see uh, asymmetric uh, cryptography in action. It's just really long and dense, and we don't have time to cover it here. So this is the contents of the key. Here's all the parts, both public and private, that go into doing your encryption. We now have a key. We've looked at it. We've verified it looks pretty sweet. I'm thinking that key looks great. Let's use it and create something else. We're going to now create a new certificate signing request. We're going to tell it to use the key we just created. And we're going to put it out to happypuppies.csr. I apologize, this is at the bottom of the screen. Um, if I could raise it up somehow, I would. Um, so we're going to specify some information, metadata information for the certificate. We're in the U.S., in North Carolina, specifically in Charlotte. We're at the Southeast Linux Fest at Self 2014, and the common name for us is happypuppies.com. Is that correct? Wow. I, that'll be immortalized forever. So now, we have just generated a certificate signing request with all of the information that I just put in. And I recognize it's a big jumble up here. Let's look at it in a little cleaner format. Did everybody get their pictures? Let's do this. Rec, go out, text, CSR. Here we go. This looks suspiciously like the CRT we looked at earlier. Only a couple things are missing. There's no issuer. There's no issue or hash. A lot of really important data are missing. You cannot use this file to sign certificates. You can't use this file to do SSL transactions. This is only, you might call it in chemistry, a precursor. This is the file that you give to your vendor. And they sign, they look at this, they review it and say, okay, you're happypuppies.com, you're in Charlotte. You must be at this really strange conference. Okay, I know who that is. And they'll sign it. We're running very low on time, so I'm going to zip through the rest of this. I'm going to go over to my self CA. I'm going to sign this certificate that I just created. Why did I do this long path? happypuppies.csr. Okay, and we're going to spit it out into the same place. Only this time, if you can see at the very bottom, we're giving it a file type of CRT. I could name it anything I wanted to. I just use a standardized naming convention because it's easier. So here we go. Oh, forgot a step. And again, this is not normally how I keep my key phrases, but I'm doing it for expediency here. You don't get to see it, sorry. So I have my intermediate certificate that I created last night. 
I have the key phrase, which is encrypted. I have just put in the key phrase. And now here it is showing me all the information from the certificate uh, signing request saying, do you trust all this? Looks pretty good. I trust it. We're going to sign the certificate and we're going to commit it to our repository. Now, I have, where is it? Demystifying part one, resources pres. Now I have a new file in here, .crt. I'm famously good at that. Okay, now I have an actual certificate signed by an intermediate certificate authority. And it doesn't matter to you whether it's an intermediate, intermediate or root. I have an actual certificate here. It's got an issuer, it's got a subject, it's got, where's the issuer hash? Somewhere in here it's got issuer, and issuer hash. I don't know where it is. It's somewhere in here. Uh, we're pretty much out of time, guys, so I'm going to have to cut it off here. Do we have any other quick questions before we call it a day? Uh, Sir? Uh, when, you, when you were assigning the key earlier, the default was 512 bits. That's correct. Is there, is there a way to change the default to say, you know, if you want it to be 28, 2048 bits every time? Yes, sir. There is a, a way to change it. It's in the OpenSSL uh, global configuration file. Or you can copy that and make your changes locally and specify in the invocation of the command to use a local configuration file. The question was, when you're generating the key, the default is 512. What if you don't want to have to type 2048 at the end of every command? You can change the default configuration file. Any other quick questions? Great. Thank you guys for coming. And stick around for part two where we're actually going to create a certificate authority. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.